Bear Down Bears fans, another edition of the Chicago Bears podcast coming your way. Pat the designer, Courtney Cronin here on a Thursday. There is football tonight and there is football happening Sunday and there is Bears football everywhere you look. I'm so excited that football's back. Real football is back, not just preseason. It was so incredibly long, Courtney. I'm so am- excited that there's a game tonight and tomorrow. Like, I feel like we forget that the Packers are playing the Eagles down in Brazil because it just never happens, especially on a Friday night. I think this is the first Friday season opener game that's taking place on uh, the last day of the work week. So it's exciting. I mean, four days away from the season opener at Soldier Field, the weather's starting to, I mean, I know today's hot, but like I looked at the forecast for Sunday. I'm like, that's football weather. Like it's here. It's, it's, it feels real now. I, any any day that's a fall day is is my day. Fall fashion <laughs> is where I get into the fashion world. That's all I got. Summer fashion, I'm like, I'm doing t-shirt, whatever pair of shorts is closest to me, some nice pants or some nice shoes. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Fall fashion, I'm in. Give me a nice hoodie. You know what I mean? I'm, I'm, I'm ready to get after it. But just like that, the Chicago Bears are ready to get after it as well. We heard from Montez Sweat today and Eric Washington about some of the defensive line things that are going on, so we got to break that down. And the Tennessee Titans defensive coordinator seems like he's a little bit more willing to press the Chicago Bears than he probably should be. I've got some numbers on why that may be a bad uh, bad idea for the Titans and why I hope that we do see that on Sunday. All that more in today's episode of the Chicago Bears podcast. Hit that like button, subscribe to the page. Lead a five-star view. Y'all know what to do. Courtney, we got a chance to hear from Montez Sweat today, somebody who we don't often hear from. um, But whenever he talks, I think that it is a good point to listen to because, listen, at the end of the day during camp, he was, when he was out there, the best player uh, on that field to me pretty consistently. What were some of the important things that you took away from hearing from Montez Sweat today that you thought, even write the comments about preparing Caleb Williams. I thought that he was very poignant in what he said. He's ready to hit somebody else, to actually get to hit the quarterback, because remember that late July practice, the first week of training camp where he got thrown out of the two-minute drill because he hit his arm? Um, It's been a long time coming. He barely played during the preseason, you know, as much as any other prominent starter. So he's ready to get out there and and show what this pass rush can do and we won't know we never do we won't know what this pass rush looks like until they're at game speed until you can unleash someone like Montez Sweat and seeing how a team counteracts him like you know how that's going to either hinder or help the pass rush uh and it'll show the Bears I think pretty quickly this season if there are still holes that need to be addressed via an in-season trade by the deadline but This is a defense that has been preparing Caleb Williams since OTAs, like figure, you know, throwing a lot at him over the last couple of months. Matt Eberflus made it so clear early on that they did not want to hold Caleb Williams back from anything or anything back from Caleb Williams. And they didn't like, you know, I think it, I remember asking Montez Sweat about this a couple of weeks ago and just kind of hearing today, like, what are your final like impressions and takeaways from the quarterback that you've prepared now for five months? Like there was a moment in practice, one of the August practices where Sweat chases him out of the pocket. And if this isn't your quarterback, like that dude is hurting. Like if you were actually able to hit him, holy moly. And it's, you know, it's those moments that I think really teach Caleb Williams you know, what he can get away with and what he can't. And that's not something that's very easy to simulate, even going against your own defense when you do have guys like Montez Sweat who are great players. Like, you can't really gauge, okay, how am I going to react to this? Like, I know that, like, at times they're going full speed, but he still can't hit you. So those are the times where I think you saw Caleb Williams grow in learning, okay, this is what it's going to feel like in some respects against a real defense at live NFL speed, because the speed of the game is always so much faster, no matter what any rookie thinks in the early part of the preseason, in the early part of the year, like in the preseason. Cause remember a couple of years ago when Justin Fields got killed for saying, Oh, I felt like the speed of the game was fine. He said during a preseason game pretty quickly, once he ended up getting his first start in that Cleveland game, learned that it is very different. We're going from the preseason to the regular season. And Caleb Williams, to his credit, never said anything um, along those lines, never made you feel like he was 
overly prepared or like was, you know, just excelling at something so much quicker than, than others, uh, especially other rookie quarterbacks. So I think he really took in what this defense was trying to prepare him for and hearing how sweat views that as their responsibility. And certainly when, when coaches say, Hey, lean on your lean on the players around you. It's not just the offense lean on this defense. This defense is pretty darn good. And This is that they're the reason why Caleb Williams will quickly have to get the mindset out of his, you know, approach of, I don't need to score 35 points a game for my team to win the way that these shootouts, because the defense at USC was so bad, like the shootouts that they got into, especially the one year they were actually competitive in his Heisman trophy season was because he had to turn into Superman. He doesn't have to, for the most part, when you have, a defense that you can lean on that is led by someone like Montez Sweat in the front end and then Jalen Johnson in the back end. Yeah, it, it, it's when I he- heard Montez Sweat talk about, you know, we, we big boys, we're hungry, we like to eat, we like to hunt. It, it, it said everything you just said right there, right? Like he's so ready to just get after somebody who's not his quarterback. My favorite part about Montez this whole training camp has been when <laughs> – after Flus throws him out of practice, he's still getting to Caleb. He's still really getting there. But then, like, he basically else. gives up halfway through the play, just yep. puts his arms up, and it's just like, all right, I'm done. I'm not going to hit the quarterback this time. Like, to me, that level of impact, and I know we've all often talked about the guy on the other side of Montez Sweat, the guy on the other side of Montez Sweat, but what is your expectation when you have a guy like Javon Dexter who's shown a step in the right direction? Does it still feel like that that defensive line will still have a massive hole given how we kind of have seen Montez go about this? Like he looks like one of the best defensive ends in the NFL. I don't know if it's, if he's able to get that consistent pressure, if it's going to be as high on Ryan Pohl's list of things to do this season. I mean, it's all going to depend on what the numbers look like, the quarterback yeah. hits, the the QB hurries, the pressures, the sacks. Like, it cannot be what it was last year, and the Bears Absolutely. feel comfortable just standing pat and not doing anything. Now, you know, week one, will you have the answer of, oh, my God, this pass rush is great, or, oh, my God, it's it's terrible? I don't think so. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a Tennessee is not a top-end talent team, like, which is okay, like, for – you know, it's not bad if you're the Bears starting out. I mean, they have invested in the offensive line. Like, they brought in J.C. Latham. He's their left tackle. Um, They have spent, you know, they spent, they've made additions. And they've, you know, Peter Skaronsky was last year. Like, they're a team that's trying to build the offensive line, similar, I think, to the way, like, Detroit did, where you're going spending high marquee draft picks every single year to get this group where it needs to be. But they're still young. Like, Lloyd Cushenberry came there from Denver, um, Dylan Radna, Radna's or however you say his last name. I think he was, he's been there for a couple of years, but like the rest of it's like, all right, is this going to be like, how big of a test is this going to be for the defensive line? What are they going to do to Montez sweat? Are they going to try to like keep extra, you know, is this going to be a max protect week? You'd think it would be because Montez sweat on the, on one side, but I'm really curious to see how the bears move him around. Cause that didn't happen last year in Washington and then yeah. it took until week 14. If you look at the numbers between like him starting out on the left side of the defensive line and then kind of, you know, moving throughout the game to play on the right edge as well, that helps alleviate the chips and the blocks that like he has to face and, you know, making his job or at least attempting to make his job a little bit easier. So I, I mean, from a matchup perspective, you'd think that the bears want to take advantage of a rookie left tackle, but I think that he's going to have the edge on, on both of these, um, matchups that he's going to have either the right side or the left side because nicholas yeah. petite for like i don't you know they, they, he's he's the right tackle and you've got a rookie first rounder at left tackle i feel like montez sweat's going to have the advantage on both of those and, and the bears are going to yeah. try to use that to their advantage while still in the process of all that figuring out what the rotation is going to look like on the side opposite sweat that's that's another thing that I thought that was brought up that was very interesting today is the rotation. We we got to hear from Eric Washington today and he talked a little bit about the rotation. What's the what is essentially the game plan for how this defensive line is going to play out because I mean now right you've added a couple of pieces here over the last couple of weeks where you, know, you got some sack number guys on this team but maybe they're not the best guys versus the run. I would say probably your best guy opposite Montez Sweat is still DeMarcus Walker yeah, versus the run. I would say and I think that 
like when when they trot the defense out there, if they're going to start on defense or not, like the starting defensive end opposite Montez Sweat will be Demarcus Walker. And then if you're trying to keep guys fresh and you're trying to make sure that you have fresh legs in there to be able to rattle a second year quarterback, which I think Will Levis, if he can get outside the pocket, like and use his mo- mobility and spurts, that that can be a little dangerous. Um, I think the jury's still out. We don't. He only had like eight or nine starts last year after the Tannehill um benching took place it's right. it's you know we'll see what he's able to do but like the best way that the bears can prepare for that is having a constant rotation to make sure that the guys opposite sweat are are keeping this pass rush so that there's not a drop off like right so from whether it's Darrell taylor whether it's um you know austin booker i'm really curious to see does austin how much run if any does Austin Booker get on Sunday? Cause like how many defensive linemen are they going to have active? Right? Like we know Zach yeah. Pickens is on the injury report. He's limited right now, but like, do they, you know, certainly depth in the interior is important. If he's good enough to play, will they make him active? Like for the, for the game day roster, they've got a lot of defensive linemen and I don't know if every single one of them is going to be active just based on, you know, where they need, where they want, might want to go heavier at some positions on game day. So this is probably, if you're thinking about things that you want to watch for on Sunday, I think, I mean, certainly Caleb Williams will be number one, but like further down the list, but not far down the list is what is this defensive line rotation starting to look like? Because yeah. we know who the starters are, at least like you can pencil in Demarcus Walker as the starter opposite Montez Sweat. How long does he stay in the game before they start like pulling in guys and subbing guys in for various sub packages or just certain downs? Like watch who is who is where on certain downs. And when they're in those true pass rush, pin your ears back situations, who are the guys that they're relying on to try to go get after the quarterback opposite Montez Sweat? With what we heard from Montez, I I guess it's, you know, maybe I overlooked this a little bit, but I would assume that his game plan is to be playing on Sunday. We saw him pop up on the, on the injury report for Wednesday yesterday. I would assume that they're expecting that Montez is going to be fine to go this Sunday, even though he was, yeah, he's got a toe injury. Um, those are the worst. As somebody who's coming off of the small things injury with a uh, with a wisdom tooth removal yesterday, I'm back. Y'all couldn't keep me down. Uh, the small things are the worst injuries in the yeah, world. Yeah, like especially like feet because you have to plant, you have to push like off your foot, you have to pivot. Like I, you know, he he, he was out there at practice when we were out there. I imagine that they're just trying to like be as cognizant with this as possible, and we don't know. Is this the same injury that like limited sweat throughout training camp? Is it something a pain management tolerance thing that he can either get, you know, a shot of something on Sunday morning just to make sure he's he's playing pain free or as much as possible? I don't think there will be anything that keeps him out of this game on Sunday. Just kind of hearing from him how he's been chomping yeah. at the bit to get out there and hell they need him pat like they 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 couldn't afford um unless something went terribly wrong with the injury or if he had a setback they cannot afford to not have him there yeah that that is the scary part about this line right you you look at so many pieces you look at Javon Dexter you look at Montez Sweat you look at Andrew Billings and you're like all right this is a solid defensive line you want that guy opposite but 3 out of 4 ain't bad to have but if you lose any of them that's where the concerns start to come in i mean <laughs> you wanted I wanted to see more from Zach Pickens. I just did. I thought there was more in the tank. We really didn't see much of him from preseason. Uh ends up getting injured. It didn't sound like Flus was feeling great about the interior depth after that final preseason game. And of course they end up going out and signing somebody. And then you you look at Montez. If he goes down right, you're you're quickly at D Walk being your best guy out there. Maybe Austin Booker. Like it is a scary situation if you're the Bears where you have that frontline talent, but you can't afford to lose any of them. No, no. I mean, they, the depth of the D-line, you know, if it, the second that that gets tested, especially in the interior, I mean, Chris Williams is the guy that they traded for from Cleveland who was probably going to end up being cut anyways. I don't, I don't know that you feel great about that, but you do feel good that Andrew Billings and Jervon Dexter and the duo that those two form um, on the interior, you feel good about the strides that Dexter has made in year two. And now we get a chance to see like it, you know, against this off against this offensive line of Tennessee, can't he, I mean, there's some experience on the interior there. Like I said, with uh, Radnuns and, and Cushenberry, like those are guys who have played in the league now for a couple of years. Can, can Dexter use his size advantage? Remember early on, like one of the first days of training camp when he just stood up and tipped a pass from Caleb? Yes. Like that's that. those are the type of plays that I, I think the Bears hope that like instinctually he can produce pretty frequently for them. 
Um, but yeah, there's a lot riding on not just like the health and keeping those guys fresh, but like there's a talent drop off considerably from what you have on the interior with your starting guys to where, you know, what the backups look like. Yeah, it's it's one of those situations where right now it feels like the Bears have a massive advantage uh, on the defensive line versus most of the teams on this schedule, especially versus the Tennessee Titans right now. But you do wonder, you know, if you start to have some issues, how long does that advantage last? Uh Let's take a look at the offensive side, though, Courtney, because offensively, uh, that's that's where everybody's eyes are going to be on this team. By the way, hit that like button, subscribe to the page. Lead a five-star view. Y'all know what to do if you haven't done so already. Uh, Caleb Williams is going to be the focus of this team, and it seems like the uh, the Titans' defensive coordinator doesn't want to make things too easy on him. Denard Wilson talked yesterday, I believe. Uh, he made these comments about what his game plan was going to be versus the Chicago Bears. Dominant uh, wide receiving core. Uh, three names that are absolutely monsters uh, against uh, most defenses if you play them regularly. But how he talked about it was he said, for me, I believe press or less. I want them to line up. I want them to be in front of receivers and challenge those receivers. Ultimately, in this game, if you get free access, it's easy for this quarterback, the quarterback to complete the ball. So what it, uh, So what I do is I want to create hesitation at the line, want him to throw that 50-50 ball, make them earn it. From day one, we press everything. And what, what gets me a little bit giddy, a little bit excited about that, I don't know if you saw this come out from a PFF, as I like to call it, PFF. Uh, drop this nugget on the top 10 best wide receivers versus press coverage. And, uh, well, would you look at that? Two of them are already on the Chicago Bears. And DJ Moore, uh, what it said about him was he had 29 receptions of 15-plus yards when facing press coverage. He averaged 2.56 yards per route. He is the eighth best wide receiver versus press coverage. And Keenan Allen dropped just six of his 91 catchable targets he saw versus press coverage last season. That's a lot of press on a dude that's only dropped six passes and averaged 2.63 yards per route run. Uh, he was number nine on that list. So two of the top 10 press guys in the league on this team is this going to be a good game plan for the uh, for the Tennessee Titans, given the fact that the reason he's doing it is probably to create a little bit of that second of hesitation in the mind of Caleb? Yeah, and I mean, it's who knows? Like, I mean, he also said, like, if you think where Denard Wilson comes from, it's the Greg Williams, um, Todd Bowles. Those are like the people that he's mentioned are, you know, mentors helped, you know, helped shape his philosophy, he came from Baltimore. He was in Philly for a year. Um the what he said like the yet today is like you know he wants to attack and mix coverages but that the titans may not necessarily throw the sink that's the word that he used at williams i don't know how much you're actually going to glean from these comments he's making publicly but what you know is that going against a rookie quarterback you're going to try to blitz him a lot you're going to try to throw a lot of looks disguises coverages on the back end um that he doesn't that he hasn't seen and the bears yeah. have tried to prepare him for as much as they can but there will inevitably undoubtedly be something that throws caleb williams off what you don't want to see is a free rusher coming at the quarterback like you want and that's you know that's it's not just caleb that has to prepare for the looks that the, he may not know because there's just not a lot of, there's such little stuff that happened in the preseason that you can actually right. go off of because everybody's v d defense is vanilla and this is denard wilson's first time as a play caller so you so the whole idea of not chasing ghosts, don't invent in your mind what you think they're going to do, which that may take a quarter. It may not look very good early on. It might take yeah. the Bears some time to figure out, all right, how are they playing us? How can we adjust? And that may happen in the second quarter. It may happen in the second half to a point where once they get comfortable knowing what they have seen actually coming, not what they think is coming, but what they have actually seen with their own eyes, is be with how they're playing Caleb Williams. Um, you know, that's when they can start to adjust and attack the defense based on how the defense has been responding to what they have done. Now, Denard Wilson's comments about, you know, pressing these receivers, like both Keenan Allen and Roma Dunes, they were asked about this yesterday. And, you know, I think there's like some smiles from Keenan Allen about it, like, okay, do whatever you want. Um, yeah. You know, but I don't know, like, if you say this sort of thing publicly, I think it's more of just, like, what their mindset's going to be. Like, let's just be aggressive. It doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be playing press man coverage against them every single time. If Just reading the numbers that you read off, like, you know that might not be the best strategy against receivers who can beat press coverage, like Keenan Allen and, and DJ Moore. But, like, let's see what happens with Roma Dunze in those situations. Like, are they, you know... 
are is he as adept as the two veteran receivers here at getting getting past those looks and being able to get open still for Caleb Williams. So we'll see, but it's it's it might not be the best strategy. I I but I I tend to read that more as the defensive coordinator saying we want to be as aggressive as possible to throw as much as we can. You know they said not throwing the kitchen sink, but they want to confuse Caleb Williams. They want to get Caleb in a situation where he's uncomfortable and mixing coverages, especially with that secondary, it's not top end talent. It's not, I mean, yeah. I know that, they, that, I mean, Jamal Adams is there, Quadre Diggs, like they have a secondary. Added luxurious yeah. Name. Like, they, but these guys are all like, not like past their prime, but these aren't like these, like this just world beater secondary of guys that they were able to mix together. And everybody's like at the best point of their career. Some of these guys have been playing, playing through injury, like signed late. Like I, I think it will certainly be a very tough test. Any test for Caleb Williams, his first game as a rookie will be, but it's not like he has to go against the Baltimore Ravens defense week one, even though this is somebody who's coming from that Baltimore system. There are principles you can take from that, but it's not like the same level of talent by any stretch. Yeah, there's there's uh, it, there's no Roquan Smith over there. We got a Jeffrey <laughs> Simmons to... though, who can I've I've known Jeffrey since he was in high school. That man can wreck a game if you let him get oh, through yeah. the middle of your offensive line and into the backfield. So that is, to me, that's where it all starts. And I know it sounds cliche of things starting up front, but like he can single handedly take over a game. So oh, for yeah. for the Bears' it's, sake, it's, they've it's got it. Like when Flus talks about protecting Caleb Williams, like that is no better test to like figure out how well you can do it against this defensive front no 100 percent, especially with you know the the questions that we had at center the entire time through training camp you're going to get tested early in this and and jeffrey simmons somebody who can absolutely destroy the middle of your defense and that's where that's where young quarterbacks normally get flustered i believe the uh the record right now uh that caleb williams is looking to break here uh, i don't believe that a quarterback has won a football game in their first start since 2000 and Four, I think was the year that it said. I know a rookie, a rookie quarterback drafted number one overall has not won in his first start since David Carr did it in 02. And yeah. so like last 15 years, 02. they're 0, okay. 14 and one. Everybody else in that stretch. So yeah, I mean like history not on their side, but like you know, I think I, you'd have to go back and look at what every single one of those matchups were. I mean, what Trevor Lawrence's matchup was, Baker Mayfield. You know, those guys also gotta look at who was on their who team. Who was on their who was on their team and who they were playing. Yeah. That's part of it. I think that the Bears got a really favorable draw with Tennessee in week one. Yeah. What what is your expectation in this game before we get up out of here? What what are your is your feeling on this game? Do you have a Bears the Bears penciled in for a win in this I one? Do. do you have this one being a barn burner? Is this going to be a close one? I do. What do you think? I didn't. I'm. I think maybe this will be my first prediction that I get right because in 2022, when they were playing the 49ers, I did not predict them to win. They won that game. Like everybody else, I predicted that they would beat the Packers last year, and they didn't. So, I, I know the lines at four right now. I think that's favorable. Um, you know, their home home opener like for Tory Taylor too like I'm really curious now we've seen him like play once at Soldier Field like he, has he adapted to the conditions is he you know new long snapper like I know that this is not stuff that is like the sexiest part of the breakdown but you know, there's some things in special teams that I just keep an eye on like you know yeah. how how that whole thing plays out but I do think with the it's going to take a minute. It's not going to look good probably from the very onset of this game, but once they adapt to what Tennessee is, is doing from a defensive perspective, I think that the bears given that they've had a little experience against a front like this, this is why they scheduled the Cincinnati Bengals earlier in for that joint practice in August. Um, I think that was a good test for for what they're going to see and what they can prepare Caleb for ahead of time, what they have prepared him for. So I have the Bears winning this game. Um, I don't have a score yet, so I'll have to like come back with that at some other point. But I do think that like they, I think they cover and I think that they win. Yeah, I'm 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 in the Bears win camp. I feel like I'm always in the Bears win camp, but uh, I'm not Mike Dick in this one. But you have a feeling. Uh, no, I, there's I, a, there's a feeling here that's different because a lot of people I think. Yes. Picked, the Packers to to lose last year in that season opener, but we were all like, all right, what is this team? They were super injured. There was more questions on the Packers yeah. than it was confidence on the Bears. And, you know, 
those for a quarterback that he hadn't seen before in a regular season yeah. start, like those same sorts of questions, because Caleb has been the starting quarterback here since the day he got here. Um, I don't feel like those same sort of questions exist from like a global perspective. As you look at the Chicago bears and think about how good or not good this team will be going into the season. So I look at this and I'm like, all right, talent, like talent against talent. Like I think that the bears stack up, um, or at least have the edge in most position groups on this team. I, I don't know where you might give them the edge, maybe along the offensive line. Um, if you feel like that, like, but even that, like looking at Tennessee, like even then, like I'm still thinking about it. Like, yeah, you have some high end talent there, but that unit is still very, very young. Um, yeah. and the bears don't have a rookie that they're trying to break in at left tackle. Like that's, you know, I know it's, I know the jury's kind of still out on how well this unit can protect Caleb Williams, but even then I might probably give the bears the edge over the Titans on the offensive line based on experience. And, you know, I had a chance to talk with Coleman Shelton yesterday like they've had now a couple of weeks where it's just been the two of them the quarterback center exchange that they've perfected and getting getting the calls down and he's going to be play a huge role when he looks up and if he sees somebody changing something he's going to have to change the call change the protection listen to Caleb if Caleb's changing the protection all of those things so it's you know I, I give the Bears the talent advantage even though they have the younger quarterback and the least experienced quarterback of the two I still think that he's in a better situation for his first game in the NFL uh, to come away with the win than not. Yeah. I, I think the, and dare I say the most important person in all of this is going to be Shane mm -hmm. Waldron, how you utilize these weapons. Yeah, you know, like, we finally it, get some of the questions answered about like, yeah. what does this, why, what do the wide receiver splits look like? What does, what kind of role is DeAndre Swift going to have week one? Like how many carries is he going to get? What's he going to look like coming out of the backfield? All of that. Yeah. Or what's it, it's he going to look like catching passes? That, no, the that that essentially, right? For Caleb. Yeah, that essentially, because like, are you going to use him? Are you going to run him? Are you going to use him more in that short passing game as those extended runs, right? And we we know we've seen guys do that where the extended runs don't end up being what you hope they are. They're just short completions that don't go anywhere, right? Mm -hmm. And you're not running the football enough. What is the balance going to be with Shane Walter? He was very balanced in the preseason. Are you going to remain that balanced in the regular season? I think that's, because the biggest knock on him coming out of Seattle was didn't run the ball in in, in the moments he needed to in the red zone, uh, short short yard gains, um, didn't didn't utilize in that second year the tight ends enough, didn't use the short passing game enough. Like th those are things that we were sitting there and when we first hired him, we were like, oh, this guy sounds a little bit like Luke Getze. I'm I'm a little concerned here. What 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 do we got going here? But since seeing him play call early, seeing how he's going about play calling early. You know, different quarterbacks sometimes different get different results out of a guy, and maybe Caleb Williams will get them different results out of Shane Waldron. At least that's the hope here early on. Yeah, and it's that relationship has to be symbiotic. And if communication breaks down, because that's something that Caleb Williams pointed out, like when we're talking about preparing, you know, how are you prepared? How are the Bears preparing you for adverse moments? Because they're going to come, and I think you have to be like self aware enough to realize they're going to come, which he which he's talked about. Um, and, and part of it, he said, is usually when something goes wrong, it's because there's a breakdown in communication. So, all right, well, what were one of those things that we saw in the preseason? Remember in Hard Knocks when the headset went out? Like something as simple as that, whether that was by design, whether you get anybody to admit that like, hey, we may have done this, like not necessarily just there, but like, you know, that like people do that, like staffs do that to see how you're going to respond and how you react because you have to prepare for that happening in games. You know, he said that, you know, it's the poise factor of Caleb. Okay. Nonverbal communication, the stuff that they've been building on for months and months now to prepare for any situation if something goes awry. So you don't be you don't get yourself in a situation where you're playing from like way behind the sticks. That's we get to see like how that starts to to play out if there is some sort of breakdown on Sunday, if there if the headsets do go out, if just something's as simple as, hey, like you got the play call wrong, like how is or he sees something at the line of scrimmage, if he's adjusting the play, does he have the freedom to do that? Like all of those things are dependent on Caleb Williams and Shane Waldron being completely in sync. And it might not look pretty early on just because I think the two of them, I mean, there's nerves, there's jitters, there's, you know, figuring out a young quarterback. Okay. What happens if he does see a look that he isn't used to or hasn't seen in practice and it's an unscouted look, like how does he bounce back from that? If it's a negative play, if it's a, if it's a, 
play for positive yards and great. Like he was able to adjust right. in the fly and you'll learn more about what the quarterback's able to do and the load that he's able to shoulder as much as you will, what the play caller and play designs look like for the bears on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I can't wait to see what we're going to see out of this bears team Sunday. Courtney has a win. I have a win. We'll break it down even more tomorrow on the Chicago bears podcast. Get a little bit more in depth with the, uh, with the Tennessee Titans and the bears matchup. Uh, but as always, man, for Courtney Cronin, it's your boy, Pat, the designer, back at it again. Football is back. Who's your pick for tonight, Courtney? We got Ravens. We got Chiefs. You know, I have a hard time betting against the Chiefs at home, but I will go ahead and take the Ravens. I think that Ooh. there's some um, – they're they've had months and months and months to think about that AFC championship game, losing it on their turf. So I think the Ravens go in and, and pull out a close one. Let's hope nobody ends up punching a uh, punching a, a bench today. Yeah. Uh, as always, it's your boy, Pat, the designer. Back at it again. Y'all stay safe out there, Chicago. Bad down. One love. And uh, good luck keeping up with the Packers game in Brazil because you can't do it. Peace.